Okay, we're back with Proclus's commentary on the Timaeus. We've been uh, looking at some stuff regarding the two coordinations. Um, there was actually a lot of good material last time that we covered, but we are just gonna pick up where we left off. So our next quote, yet I was unwilling to disclose these particulars immediately as from the great interval of time since I first received them. My remembrance of them was not sufficiently accurate for the purpose of repetition. I consider it therefore necessary that I should first diligently revolve the whole in my mind. So this is Critias speaking from his own perspective, I'm trying to remember this stuff. Proclus. These things may also be surveyed in the universe, viz. that the demiurgic cause of beings which are generated according to time give subsistence to his own progeny prior to that of partial natures, and that the hypostatic cause of things generated, first intellectually perceiving himself, and seeing in himself the causes of his productions, thus gives also to other things a progression from himself, in order that he, being sufficient and perfect, may impart his own power to secondary natures. Conception, therefore, and resumption, and everything of this kind manifest the comprehension of demiurgic productive principles in one. So, Critias preparing this narration trying to recall it all in mind is compared to the demiurge reflecting on the causes of lower things contained in himself. The demiurge is of course in the intellective phase of the second hypostasis and is actually the intellective phase of the intellective phase. Uh, so doubly revertive, <clears throat> which we've talked about before sounds like he shouldn't then be a creative god. You would think it would be one of those processing deities like Rhea that would be uh, directly creative of the world, but Proclus talks about that in the commentary on the Cratylus. Um, in kind of reflecting on the principles prior to himself, contained in himself, he draws them together as a unity that can then be sown as a seed into lower orders. Next quote. And on this account, I yesterday immediately complied with your demands, for I perceived that we should not want the ability of presenting a discourse accommodated to your wishes, which in things of this kind is, a print, is of principal importance. In consequence of this, as Hermocrates has informed you, as soon as we departed from hence, by communicating these particulars with my friends here present, for the purpose of refreshing my memory, and afterwards revolving them in my mind by night, I nearly acquired a complete recollection of the affair. Proclus, why did Critias nearly remember? For he promised to accomplish what was enjoined him, because he did not accurately remember. But he first revolved the affair in his mind, conceiving that in mandates of this kind, such as that in which Socrates wishes uh, or wished to see his polity in motion, let me just restart this sentence. But he first revolved the affair in his mind, conceiving that in mandates of this kind, such as that in which Socrates wished to see his polity in motion, the greatest undertaking is to find a hypothesis from which it is possible to give what is adapted to the mandates. Okay. Um, so when there's something to do, we have to first come up with a hypothesis that fits the task. So sure, Critias uh, recognized that this story of Atlantis would address Socrates' desire in a nice way that's also historical. And this Critias accomplishes by receiving from history the war of the Atlantics and Athenians as a thing capable of exhibiting a life productive of the best polity. He also revolved this narration by night in order that he might impart it to his associates without error. He didn't really address, he just says he didn't accurately remember, but does, crit, uh, does Proclus rather address the nearly? I don't see it in that first paragraph. Again, therefore, from these things, let us betake ourselves to holes. 
for there the demiurgic cause being filled from an invisible cause, since all intellectual causes are there primarily to which he is united, according to the highest transcendency, produces the power of himself into the visible world, conformably to their will and judgment. Okay. Um, so, of course, the Demiurge is looking back on the intellectual contents of Cronus, especially, but other higher powers as well. Um, oh, yeah, one interesting thing that was said last time that I think is worth remembering, I just kind of, you know, was reminded of it by this, that souls descend because there are genesiurgic gods. There are gods of the world of generation, and so by their will, souls descend, as, as well as, uh, I guess, a kind of sin of the soul, which Proclus talks about in On the Existence of Evils, like which rank of soul descends and which doesn't. Um, but it's also the will of the gods, like primarily, ultimately, incarnation is caused by them. And so even the uh, creation of the Demiurge is caused by yet higher gods. So he's filled with these invisible causes, produces the power of himself into the visible world, conformably to their will and judgment. Farther still, not to give the narration immediately, but afterwards, is a symbol of the preparatory apparatus of nature from which perfection is produced in physical effects. You may also consider the caution of Critias ethically. The preparatory apparatus of nature? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that refers to. Another way to go here for this interpretation might have been to say you know, that uh, the Demiurge, as Proclus says in the Critias, prepares these prior forms and unites them uh, before disseminating these things into the material world and creating the material world. But the preparatory apparatus of nature, I guess, hmm, not sure. But you may also consider the caution of Critias ethically, for it is not proper to attempt things of such a magnitude rashly without first revolving the whole undertaking by ourselves, in order that we may bring them forth as from a treasury through speech, which is truly the messenger of internal reasons. Moreover, the repeating the narration to himself imitates the conversion of demiurgic reasons to themselves, according to which the soul surveys in herself by participation the productive principles of beings. So our reflection on productive principles is an image of the demiurgic reversion on the principles he contains, and to present a discourse accommodated to the wishes of those who enjoined it indicates in the fabrication of things the suspension of visible effects from their causes. Okay. Next quote. And I think I need to fix the screen share. Sorry about that for the recording slash stream. Okay. And indeed, according to the proverb, what we learn in childhood abides in the memory with a wonderful stability. For with respect to myself, for instance, I am not certain that I could recollect the whole of yesterday's discourse. Yet I should be very much astonished if anything should escape my remembrance, which I have heard in some past time very distant from the present. Thus, as to the history which I have just now related, I received it from the old man with great pleasure and delight, who on his part very readily complied with my request and frequently gratified me with the repetition of it. And hence, as the marks of letters deeply burned in remain indelible, so all these particulars became firmly established in my memory. Proclus. That children remember better than men is seen in works and has many probable causes. One indeed, as Porphyry says, because the souls of children have not an experience of human evils. Hence, as they are neither distracted nor disturbed by externals, their imagination is void of impressions, but their reasoning power is more sluggish. For experience renders this power more acute. 
But another cause is this, that the rational life in children is in a greater degree mingled with the fantasy. As therefore, in consequence of the soul being co-passive and co-mingled with the body, the body becomes stronger and more vital. After the same manner, also, the fantasy is strengthened through the habitude of reason. Okay, interesting. So, um, I guess a th thought here is like the soul of a child needs to make the body stronger and grow the body. So there is a tighter connection to the bodily nature, which reflects the training of the guardians, right? Up until age 18, it's all about music and gym gymnastics, kind of developing the body. Um, so the soul, rational powers are more bound up with body. Fantasy is sort of semi-bodily, right? Uh, like it involves the sensory uh, apparatus in some capacity. So the fantasy being more bodily is more bound up with rational activity for children and the fantasy is strengthened thereby because all of their ratiocinations involve fantasy. Fantasy is therefore exercised. And that's the same mechanism Proclus is saying why the soul strengthens the body because the soul becomes co-passive and commingled with the body to a greater extent. So rational operations become co-passive and commingled with the fantasy in the same way. And being strengthened, it has more stable impressions from receiving through its own power reason in a greater degree, just as the body is more powerful in consequence of being more vital through a more abundant communi uh, communion with the soul. A third cause, in addition to these, is that the same things appear to be greater to the imaginations of children. Hence, they are in a greater degree admired by them, so that they are more co-passive with them, and on this account especially remember them. For we deposit in the memory things which vehemently pain or vehemently delight us. They, therefore, operate on us in a greater uh, degree. Hence, as that which suffers in a greater degree from fire preserves for a longer time the heat imparted to it, after the same manner, that which suffers more from the external object of the fantasy retains the impression in a greater degree. Sure. Moreover, the imagination of children suffers more on account of the same things appearing to us to be greater during our childhood. Hence, children in a greater degree retain the impression as suffering in a greater degree from the same things. And it appears to me that Critias indicates this when he says that he heard this history from the old man with great delight, and that on this account it became firmly established in his memory, like the marks of letters deeply burnt in. But as Socrates, in the recapitulation of his polity, asserts that the cause of memory to us is the unusualness of the things which we hear, oh yeah, he says like you wouldn't be likely to forget the marriage situation because of its uh, unusualness. Thus Critias, in what is here said, ascribes this cause to the age of children. For everything that occurs to children at first appears to be unusual, and perhaps this brings with it an indication that the prolific fabrication of gods I have to kind of adjust something on my desk real quick. There we go. Okay. And perhaps this brings with it an indication that the prolific fabrication of gods of the second rank is suspended from the stable sameness of those of the first order. Just as the memory of a boy is the cause of memory to the associates of Critias. Hmm. I'm not seeing the second order and first order gods. Is this second coordination, first coordination? Maybe not. Um, if someone, however, in addition to these solutions, should adhere to the whole theory of things, let him hear Iamblichus asserting that the memory of children indicates the ever-new, flourishing, and stable production of reasons. 
the indelibility of the letters, the perpetually flowing and never failing fabrication, and the alacrity of the teacher, the unenvying and abundant supply afforded by more ancient causes to secondary natures, for these things also have a place in conjunction with the before-mentioned solutions. Oh yeah, that is, that's a good point. The, uh, his, what was the relation? Was it his grandfather or I forget the elder Critias? What's the familiar relation there? The old man. Um, Wasn't it his, his grandfather? I was thinking it is. Um, we'll just go with that not terribly important but anyway his grandfather was willing to uh continually reiterate the narration and so that's the unenvying and abundant supply afforded by more ancient causes to secondary natures um so okay noted and i think it's fine to just go on in consequence of this, as soon as it was day, I repeated the narration to my friends, that together with myself, they might be better prepared for the purposes of the present association. But now, with respect to that for which this narration was undertaken, I am prepared, O Socrates, to speak not only summarily, but also as to descend to the particulars of everything which I heard. We shall, uh, rather, we shall transfer, however, to reality the citizens and city which you fashioned yesterday as in a fable, considering that city which you established as no other than this Athenian city, and the citizens which you conceived as no other than those ancestors of ours described by the Egyptian priest. And indeed, the affair will harmonize in every respect, nor will it be foreign from the purpose to assert that your citizens are those very people who existed at that time. Hence, distributing the affair in common among us, we will endeavor, to the utmost of our ability, to accomplish, in a becoming manner, the employment which you have assigned us. It is requisite, uh, requisite, excuse me, requisite, therefore, to consider, O Socrates, whether this discourse is reasonable or whether we should lay it aside and seek after another. Okay. Shortly after this, Timaeus actually comes in, and uh, Critias here uh, is talking about it like we're all going to accomplish this goal that you set out for us, Socrates. Uh, to kind of bring the city, the ideal city, to life in a conflict. So Critias has his, his historical aspect. Timaeus recounts the constitution of the universe. Why would that be? Well, because the ideal city is modeled on the constitution of the universe, the cosmos. And so, in a way, that is bringing it to life as well. And uh, illustrating the conflict, the cosmic war that um, substantiates that constitution at the cosmological level. Whereas Critias captures it metaphorically in the history. Hmm. But it still seems like a kind of non sequitur when Timaeus comes in and he's talking about physics. Like up to this point, the dialogue is not obviously about physics. Okay. Proclus. Before, Critias made his associates partakers of his narration, but now he calls on them to accomplish, in conjunction with him, the employment assigned them. Okay. Right. Because in the paradigms, all things, indeed, are united on high and fill each other with intellectual powers, but in the demiurgic world or in the world in the intellect of the demiurgic, they subsist with each other, according to a certain divine and total conspiration. So what's the difference there? In the paradigms, all things are united on high, fill each other with intellectual powers, but in the mind of the demiurge, they subsist with each other according to a certain divine and total conspiration conformably to which and through which all things are everywhere appropriately in each. Hence, in the heavens, the paradigms of generated natures pre-exist, and in generation there are images of celestial natures. Since, however, wholeness everywhere precedes parts, this also may be seen in the second fabrication. 
Okay, we're just moving on from that point. Um, I don't know what the significance of that is. In paradigms, things are united on high, fill each other with intellectual powers, and then it's a certain divine and total conspiration which joins the ideas together in the mind of the demiurge. But that's the difference between calling his associates partakers of his narration. I guess they're at the level of paradigms there, and now he's calling on them, them to conspire together with him. So I, I guess I see that. I don't know if it's been properly explained why at one point they were speaking from the perspective of the paradigms and in another from the perspective of the mind of the demiurge. But okay. Um, maybe because at the beginning of the narration where he first talks about them in that way, the demiurgic act hadn't been unfolded. Whereas once he's given the, the narration and these last remarks, he's like gotten to the demiurgic act because he's reflected or reverted all these particulars and brought them together and is now ready, just like the demiurge is for the act of creation and the conspiracy with uh, powers at his level, powers inside his own mind. So I can sort, I can see some rationalizations for why that would be fitting, but okay. Hence, in the heavens, the paradigms of generated natures pre-exist, and in generation, there are images of celestial natures. Since, however, wholeness everywhere precedes parts, this also may be seen in the second fabrication. On this, so the second fabrication, I'm pretty sure, is the sublunar world. Celestial is first, sublunar is second, what joins them is third, I think. He just introduced this terminology with, without ever, like really giving a breakdown of what are the fabrications precisely. I think a footnote by Taylor gave these three fabrications. On this account, Critias first summarily discusses the war, but afterwards he endeavors to explain more copiously every particular, narrating all the polity of the Atlantics and the principle of their generation, how they turned to injustice, how the Athenians proceeded to war, from what apparatus, from what legis... Uh, from what legations, through what ways, with whom they were co-arranged, and such things as are consequent to these. Yeah, so you can see then uh, the abbreviated account, abbreviated rather, abbreviated account is like, uh, I guess, the creation prior to the Demiurge, where things are joined by participation, and then the conspiracy in the Demiurge goes into more depth and uh, complexity and gives rise to further complexity in the narration or logos that it creates. Something along those lines. Um, and I don't know what the word legations means. It's oh, used yeah, like now a legate. For... Yeah. Hmm. Like a... We use it now for like a um, ambassador for for like a special purpose, um, like to to make sure to negotiate a treaty or make sure that its terms are being enforced or right whatever. Like you'd send a legation for a special purpose, not not just generically. Mm -hmm. So through what representatives does the war uh, is the war coordinated? etc. Okay. The genuine polity, therefore, of Socrates is an imitation of the first fabrication. Right? So it's modeled on the uh, cosmos, but more specifically than the cosmos generally, it is the celestial sphere. Hence, indicating the mystic nature of it and its pre-existence in pure reason, he says that it was fashioned as it were in a fable. Okay. But the hypothesis of the Athenians has an indication as in images of the second fabrication. So it's not just an image of the first fabrication, but in images of the second, in which that which is more partial presents itself to the view, and what remains consists of contrariety in motion, and that which is circumscribed in place. 
Since, however, the second is suspended from the first fabrication and is in continuity with it, hence he says that the affair will harmonize in every respect and that it will not be foreign to the purpose to assert that the citizens in the Republic of Socrates are the very people who existed at that time. Okay, okay, actually, the deal with the first and second fabrication, I think he's saying the genuine polity, the ideal state, is in the image of the celestial sphere, but then there's an image in the fable of the Athenians and Atlant Atlanteans of the second fabrication, the sublunar world, so there's the distinction, like one is the archetype or paradigm, the celestial, and then the other is sublunar world of generation image of that first fabrication. So, all right, I think that's good enough. Now, Socrates, but what other, O Critias, should we receive in preference to this? For your discourse, through a certain affinity, is particularly adapted to the present sacrifice to the goddess. And besides this, we should consider, as a thing of the greatest moment, that your relation is not, mere, uh, is not a mere fable, but a true history of transcendent magnitude. It is impossible, therefore, to say how and from whence, neglecting your narration, we should find another more convenient. Proclus. Socrates approves the narration of Critias in the first place as adapted to the festival of the Athenians, for the Atlantic War is an image of mundane wars, and as a hymn accommodated to the sacrifice to Minerva. Athena. For if speech is of any advantage to men, it should be employed in hymns. Okay. Um, and besides this, since the goddess is the cause of both theory and action, through sacrifice indeed, we imitate her practical energy, but through the hymn, her theoretic energy. Okay, so it's not just sacrifices that would be appropriate for... Okay, he says, particularly adapted to the present sacrifice to the goddess, because um, they're in the... Is this the Bendidian festival? Yeah, in, in any case, it's a festival devoted to Athena... That is currently going on and so it's appropriate uh the sacrifice imitates her practical energy through the hymn her theoretic energy okay but in the second place socrates approves the narration as bearing witness to the possibility of his polity for this in his discourse about it he thought worthy of demonstration for it was sufficient for him that this scheme of a polity existed in the heavens and in one man since all things that have an external have an internal subsistence, and that which is truly law begins from the internal life itself. If also he shows that this polity once prevailed among the Athenians, he certainly demonstrates the possibility of it. This, therefore, has such like causes as these. Again, however, it may, not, uh, it may be assumed from these things that the narration about the Atlantics is not a fiction. Okay. as some have supposed it to be, but a history indeed, yet having an affinity to the whole fabrication of the world. So that such things as Plato discusses about the magnitude of the Atlantic island must not be rejected as fabulous and fictitious on account of those who enclose the earth in a very narrow space. Remember, he was interpreting the myth from the Phaedo with the, the earth, earth is much larger, we're in like a depression here, um, he interpreted that totally literally and was saying those who measure the earth and like judge it to be uh, a sphere of whatever shape, like, uh, I'm not going to remember the first guy who did that, his name, but it's not important. Um, anyway, uh, definitely had been done plenty of times uh, by Proclus's time, but he's saying they're judging the measure of the earth within our kind of depression but actually the earth is much larger. So Plato, I mean, uh, Proclus just totally, literally interprets that. Um, but even if you do buy the ancient geographers and present um, science about the size of the earth, Plato's account still just makes sense uh, geographically. There could have been an island in the Atlantic and North and South America would be the surrounding continent. Okay, so we're moving on from Atlantis now, I believe, pretty soon here. 
Keep going. Hence, it is requisite that you should speak with good fortune, but that I, on account of my discourse yesterday, should now rest from speaking and be attentive to what you have to say. Plato does not, like the Stoics, assert that the worthy man has no need of fortune, but he is of opinion that our dianoetic energies, since they are complicated with corporeal energies, according to external progression, should be inspired by good fortune, in order that they may proceed fortunately, and that their effect upon others may be friendly to divinity. Okay, so fate, I think, is what's meant by fortune here. Heimarmene, as opposed to ananke, necessity, and fate, heimarmene, is only responsible for uh, material events. It governs the coordination of events in space and time. And so the worthy man living the life of intellect seemingly would have no need for fortune then, but our dianoetic energies are being, you know, complicated with our corporeal energies, according to external progressions, are bound up with space and time and should therefore be inspired by good fortune. Or maybe this is a different word than fate. It Very possibly it is. Um, let me look up goddess of fortune, Greek, TK. Goddess of success, fortune, luck, and prosperity. So anyway, I, th I do think this is bound up with the concept of fate anyway, because the interpretation I was just mentioning seemed to be working pretty well. Um, so dianoic energies are bound up with the body, and so we should be in accord with good fortune or good fate, well-ordered fate, providentially guided fate, in order that they may proceed fortunately, the, uh, those dianoetic energies, and that their effect upon others may be friendly to divinity. Because they're governed by fortune, which is a goddess. And as Nemesis is the inspector of light words, thus also good fortune, inspector of light words. Okay. Um, I guess were things spoken lightly. Thus also good fortune directs the words both of those that receive and of him that utters them to a good purpose in order that the former may receive benevolently and sympathetically, but the latter may impart in a divinely inspired manner that which is adapted to every one. Okay, so Nemesis, goddess of... Uh, like not just conflict generally, but let's get a like more specific description. Uh, yeah, personified especially retribution for the sin of hubris. The Hyperboreans, I've been looking at them recently, are said by uh, um, starts with the P, poet Pindar said by Pindar to be f totally free from the influence of Nemesis. So they have no hubris. Um, but okay, so just as Nemesis inspects light words, so good fortune directs the words, both of the hearer and the listener, or sorry, the speaker and the listener, um, to be received benevolently and sympathetically and to impart in a divinely inspired manner what is adapted to everyone. So, okay, so he said how dianoetic energies should be in accord with good fortune because they're bound up with the body and fortune governs the expression of those dianoetic energies in speech, where especially, you know, it's visible that they are bound up with the body. Thus, therefore, in partial natures, but in wholes, good fortune signifies a divine allotment. And what was the original mention of fortune in the quote? Hence, it is requisite that you should speak with good fortune, but that I, on account of my discourse yesterday, should now rest from speaking. Good fortune in holes. Okay, so that this is like uh, reading the text at face value. Should it, should a discourse and intellectual energy be subject to fortune or fate? Well, yes, because those energies are bound up with the body. 
and they should accord with the goddess there. But in holes, so now interpreting this metaphorically, I suppose, good fortune signifies a divine allotment, according to which each thing is allotted an order adapted to it from the one father and the whole fabrication. So you should speak with good fortune is compared to you should abide in your proper allotment from the one father and total fabrication. Moreover, for Socrates to speak, to rest from speaking and to be attentive to what may be said has indeed an appropriate retribution. For the other persons of the dialogue did this when he narrated his polity. But this shows from analogy how all demiurgic causes being united to each other have at the same time separate productions. For to hear is indicative of receiving through each other. And for the others to rest when one speaks signifies the unmingled purity according to which each demiurgic cause produces and generates secondary natures from its own peculiarity. So, yeah, it, the demiurgic production is like uh, a group of people engaged in a discourse governed by good fortune, taking turns, active and passive, indicating their separate activities, uh, but also their conspiracy uh, in the creation. Critias. But now consider, Socrates, the manner of our disposing the mutual banquet of discussion. For it seems proper to us that Timaeus, who is the most astronomical of us all, and is eminently knowing in the nature of the universe, should speak the first, commencing his discourse from the generation of the world and ending in the nature of men. Okay, so this little bit here it pretty much sets up in the text, and maybe I've missed that before, why we go from all this other stuff. He addresses explicitly why we're uh, going to a physical description because if we're going to bring them to life, we need to like explain how men came to be, and then we can have the drama involving those men. But that I, after him, receiving the men which he has mentally produced, but which have been excellently, excellently educated by you, and introducing them to you according to the narration and law of Solon, as to proper judges, should render them members of this city, as being in reality no other than those Athenians which were described as unknown to us in the report of the sacred writings, and that in future we shall discourse concerning them as about citizens and Athenians. Proclus. The intention, uh, the intention of this arrangement is to make Timaeus a summit, and at the same time a middle, for he speaks after Socrates and Critias, and prior to Critias and Hermocrates. And thus indeed, he is a middle, but in another respect he is a summit, according to science, because he generates the men whom Socrates indeed educates, but Critias arms. This, however, is also a manifest symbol of total fabrication, which is, at one and the same time, a summit and a middle. For it is exempt from all mundane natures, and is equally present to all. So it's a summit being exempt, but is in the middle as being omnipresent. The summits, so the total fabrication, I guess, combines the three fab, uh, fabrications. The summits, likewise, of the middle of the universe belong to the Demiurge, according to the doctrine of the Pythagoreans. For the tower of Jupiter is, as they say, situated there. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I mean, it would make sense that the summits uh, of lower orders are joined to higher orders rather than any old part of the middle fabrication. Um, but what is that tower of Jupiter? Is that tower of Zeus? Is he just talking about Mount Olympus? Maybe he's just talking about Mount Olympus. I don't know. Uh, but Critias, who spoke as the middle after Socrates, now again summarily speaks prior to Hermocrates. For the dyadic pertains to the middle fabrication, which is what Critias especially is illustrating. Socrates talked about the first fabrication. Critias is talking about the middle fabrication more so, exemplified in human affairs, and also the whole in conjunction with parts. 
just as the whole prior to parts belongs to the first, but parts to the last fabrication. Okay, um, now this the fabrication issue kind of breaks down. The way he's using it here does not sound like it's compatible with celestial sublunar and what joins them. Instead here, it sounds like the first fabrication will have to be um, intelligibles. The second fabrication, we're dealing with holes in conjunction with parts, so maybe cosmos... Um, as a whole, or maybe celestial there, but celestial doesn't work because we know that we're dealing with uh, sublunar natures. That's definitely been referenced explicitly. And then the whole, or rather the parts belong to the last fabrication. How is it that parts belong to that last fabrication? I don't want to worry too much about it because I'm pretty confident still he has not elaborated the fabrications adequately. We'll just keep an eye out for that. But, okay, Critias being dyadic, uh, pertains to the middle fabrication and also the whole in conjunction with parts. So uh, I'm not too sure about what exactly is meant, but Critias comes up twice because he reflects the dyadic, I would say. At least a surface level aspect of what Proclus is saying. Hence, Socrates summarily delivered his polity, and Hermocrates contributed to the parts of the history which was about to be narrated by Critias, and thus much concerning the whole arrangement. Okay, um, so Timaeus represented the demiurge of wholes, Socrates the intelligible demiurge, or intellectual demiurge rather, Critias represented like the equivalent of Poseidon and then Hermocrates of Hades. So the three fabrications could then be Socrates, Poseidon, and Hades at one level, but that doesn't tell us specifically which parts are being covered by which. But again, we'll just kind of keep an eye out for that. Someone, however, may doubt what will be left for Hermocrates to accomplish after Timaeus has delivered the generation of the men, Socrates their education, and Critias their actions. For to these things there is nothing successive. May it not be said that Hermocrates is the adjutor of Critias in his narration. I, is that just a helper? Adjutor? helper assistant is he the helper of Critias in his narration for the relation of the history was a mixture of deeds and words and Critias himself promised to make a discussion of the actions but calls on Hermocrates to assist him in the words for the imitation of these is difficult as was before observed hence in the Atlanticus Critias having assembled the gods as consulting about the punishment of the Atlantics he says Zeus thus addressed them, and he thus terminates the dialogue as delivering to Hermocrates the imitation of the words. Okay, so Proclus is interpreting that the end of the dialogue, the Critias, which, do, which ends with these terms, right? Zeus is contemplating how to punish the um, Atlanteans. Hermocrates supposedly was supposed to then pick up with this speech of, of Zeus. All right. But there is no absurdity in his not discussing in the Critias the remainder of the deeds. For in short, having assembled the gods for the purpose of chastising the insolence of the Atlantics, he has everything consequent to this comprehended in the gods being thus collected, viz. the preparation of the Athenians, their egress, and their victory. Okay. So... Again, Socrates did the education, Critias did the actions, and so, and then Hermocrates assists supposedly with the speech of Zeus and uh, the actions. Once you get the gods collected and they're contemplating the punishment, everything, all the other actions are seminally contained. This seems like he's just trying to make it work personally. Proclus, that is. We'll keep going. 
Timaeus therefore generates the men, Socrates educates them, Critias leads them forth to actions, and Hermocrates to words. The first of these imitating the paternal cause, the second the supplier of stable intelligence, the third the supplier of motion and progression to secondary natures, correlated with Poseidon as the second demiurge, and the fourth imitating the cause which converts the last of things to their principles through the imitation of reasons, i.e. of productive powers, Hades as Hermocrates. Thus, therefore, these particulars may be symbolically understood, and perhaps in no very superfluous manner. Someone also may doubt why the Timaeus had not an arrangement prior to the Republic, since in the former dialogue the generation of the world and also of the human race is delivered. For it is necessary, as Timaeus says, that men should be generated, and also that they should be educated, which Socrates effects in the Republic, and that they should energize in a manner worthy of their education, which in a certain respect uh, the Critias exhibits. And if indeed Plato beginning from the end proceeded to the Timaeus, which is the first by nature, it will be asserting what is usual to say, that for the sake of doctrine, things that are first to us, though posterior by nature, are first delivered. Okay. But that now he appears to have arranged the middle as the first, and the first as the middle, and if indeed this arrangement had been ad adopted by those who are studious of ornament, it would have been less wonderful. But now Plato himself appears to have acted in this manner. He, here, therefore, there is a recapitulation of the polity as having been already summarily narrated in the shortest manner. In answer to this doubt, it must be said that if all hypotheses were assumed from the nature of things now in existence, okay, in answer to this doubt, it must be said, if all hypotheses were assumed In answer to this doubt, it must be said that if all hypotheses were assumed from the nature of things now in existence, of which were or which were formerly, it would be necessary that the doubt should be valid and that the Timaeus is not rightly ranked in the second place. So if we only worked from what had already been explained and you know unfolded in a systematic manner like kind of chronologically then that doubt would be correct but it's a pedagogic thing and i guess also a stylistic thing if also all the narrations were devised from hypothesis it thus would be requisite that such things as are first according to nature should be first assumed so this was like a syllogistic unfolding but it's not it's a uh, education but since the hypothesis of socrates subsists in words alone and surveying the universal applies itself to the nurture and education of men but the hypothesis consequent to this discusses beings and things in generation these are very properly conjoined to each other okay so proclus's point is that uh socrates is dealing with kind of the paradigms and logical and then the universe deals with the corporeal so in that respect it's fair to put socrates's narration first while the hypothesis of socrates as only subsisting in words and being on this account accurate has an arrangement prior to the rest perhaps likewise plato wishes or wished to indicate this to us that such things as divine human souls and which are ascending to the intelligible produce these are some time or other affected on the earth. According to certain prosperous vicissitudes of circulations. Okay. Such things as divine human souls produce, these at some time or other are affected on the earth. Okay. So like Socrates as kind of playing the role of the guardian who is reflecting on the intelligible paradigm of the perfect state um that's a production of his soul and of any perfectly philosophical soul who attains to the archetype of the ideal state that will at some time or other be affected on earth and so there too unfolding the material aspect and historical unfolding of this paradigm 
makes sense as a posterior thing. As Critias, therefore, asserts this, bearing testimony to Socrates, we must say that those true ancestors of ours, of which the priest spoke, perfectly accord with those citizens which Socrates mentally conceived. And our opinion is not to be rejected that they were those who existed at that time. If, however, the Republic is inferior to the Timaeus because it is conversant with that which is partial and to discuss mortal affairs is to dwell on an image, yet the universal prevails in it. For the same form of life exhibits indeed in the soul justice, but in a city, a polity, and in the world, fabrication. Okay. Uh, farther still, the deliberate choice of virtue is free, but the energy which is directed to externals requires the mundane order and hence the Atlanta, the Critias is posterior to the Timaeus. Right. Um, so talking about history directed towards externals requires the mundane order, so it has to be after the, Timaea, the Timaeus, but then the kind of intellectual reflection of the philosopher thinking about the ideal state, that's a free action, doesn't require externals, so we don't have to create the universe first and then tell the Republic. But the habit of the citizens shows that virtue is without a master. Plato also manifests through these things that the soul, when she is of herself and does not depend on another, is superior to every physical hypostasis and runs above fate. But when she verges to actions, is vanquished by physical laws and is in subjection to fate. In addition also to what has been said, it is requisite to know this, that from the order of human life delivered in the Republic, the connection of these dialogues may be obtained. For in that dialogue, the men are first educated and instructed through disciplines. Afterwards, they ascend to the contemplation of true beings, and in the third place, descend from thence to a providential attention to the city. Conformably to this congruity, the Republic has an arrangement prior to the Timaeus and the Timaeus to the Atlanticus. For the men being instructed by the Republic and elevated according to the theory of the Timaeus will, living happily, wisely perform such actions. Okay, so the Timaeus is like the contemplation of intelligible. It's kind of a loose analogy, but Republic is like the training of the Guardians. Timaeus is like them uh, contemplating true beings. And then uh, the Critias is them happily, wisely performing such actions as the Critias narrates, After this manner, therefore, we dissolve the doubt. The philosopher Porphyry, however, not directly for the sake of this doubt, but discussing something else, affords us the following aid in its solution, that those who wish to apprehend the whole theory genuinely ought first to be instructed in the form of it, in order that being similar to the object, uh, in order that being similar to the object of intellection, they may be in a becoming manner co-adapted to the knowledge of the truth. Um, those who wish to apprehend the whole theory generally ought first to be instructed in the form of it in order that being similar to the object of intellection they may be in a becoming manner co-adapted to the knowledge of the truth it's kind of a tough sentence instructed in the form of it So somehow or other, being instructed in the form of the genuine theory makes you similar to the object of intellection, and then you can be co-adapted to the knowledge of the truth. That could definitely use elaboration, but we'll move on. This, therefore, the order itself of the dialogues demonstrates. For the auditors of the Timaeus ought first to have been benefited by the Republic, and having been adorned through it, to attend afterwards the dogmas concerning the world, evincing themselves to be most similar through erudition to the excellent order of the universe, and thus much in answer to this doubt. So yeah, reaffirmed that here we're talking about uh, instru being instructed in the form of the true theory is like that education that renders you, um, through erudition, similar to the excellent order of the universe. Moving on, each particular, however, of the text must be considered. Timaeus, therefore, is now said to be most astronomical, 
not as directing his attention to the rapidity of the celestial motions, nor as collecting the measures of the courses of the sun, nor as being conversant with the works of fate, but as astronomizing above the heavens, conformably to the Corypheus in the Theotetus, and contemplating the invisible causes, which are properly stars. So the stars, by analogy then, stars termed, like, metaphorically, are invisible causes, not the literal stars. Um, do we remember what the Corypheus is from the Theotetus? It must have been a different word. It says the leader of a party or school of thought. Um, in the Theotetus, who's the leader of a school of... Th oh, man. What could this be? Yeah, I don't have a good enough recollection of the Timaeus to answer that offhand. If anyone in the Jitsi happens to remember what that might refer the leader of a school of thought in the Timaeus contemplating the invisible causes. I don't uh, remember it all. So you will keep going. Could Hence that be, um, it, could it be um, uh, the, the Theotetus himself, or not Theotetus, who was the, the old mathematician who was leading that dialogue. Oh, yeah. Um, he's from uh, North Africa. That, um, yeah. Hippar Could it be referring to him? It starts with an H, I think. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Contemplating invisible causes, which are properly stars. Maybe this analogy of stars to invisible, like mathematical causes, was mentioned by. It can't be Hipparchus. Was it? Theotetus characters. Uh, oh, it's Theodorus, by the way. Okay. In any case, we would have to review the text of the Theotetus to get an answer to that, but fair enough. We understand the point here. Um, that is, Timaeus astronomizes according to knowledge of invisible causes, not primarily the motion of the heavens. Hence, Socrates does not exhibit the visible man, but the man that is purely essentialized in reason. And he does this as imitating the whole demiurge, in whom the heavens and all the stars subsist, as the theologist says, intellectually. Timaeus begins, however, from the generation of the world and ends in man, because man is a microcosm, possessing all things partially, which the universe does totally, as Socrates demonstrates in the Philippus. But there are certain persons educated by Socrates so in the Philibus, they basically talk about the elements and it's an argument for the world soul in saying, like, is the air in us greater or is the air in the world greater? The world, the fire in us, or the fire in the world, the fire in the world, of course, so on with the other elements. And so what about that? Uh, we have a cause of motion in ourselves. Is that inferior or superior to that in the universe? And of course, the universe will contain one superior so the universe contains wholly what we contain partially but there are certain persons educated by socrates in the most excellent manner who also educates the whole city and these are the guardians and auxiliaries for in the universe that which transcendently participates of intellect is heaven which also imitates intellect through its motion the men however are introduced by critias conformably to the law and conceptions of solon because solon narrates that the athenians were once thus governed and established laws how children ought to be introduced into the polity and into the tribes and how they ought to be registered and likewise by what kind of judges they should be tried 
in one place from the tribes, but in another from the appropriate persons. As Critias therefore admits that the men educated by Socrates were Athenians, he follows the conceptions of the law of Solon, conformably to which certain persons are introduced into the polity. Okay, yeah, uh, some of this stuff was a little bit harder to follow today. Um, still some good stuff. So we will pick up here. Hopefully we have time during the week to get back to this. If not, then next Saturday and all the usual groups tomorrow. Uh, any last thoughts on the reading today? Okay, well, uh, take care.